Welcome to the Mama Safe Ed podcast, Birth Story Friday. In this episode, Kaylin is going to be sharing her unmedicated home birth story with a non-emergent transfer in the postpartum for her baby. After Kaylin's birth story, Roxanne and I are going to discuss some common reasons that you may transfer during labor or postpartum if you're having an out-of-hospital birth, such as a home birth or a freestanding birth center. Yeah. Welcome to the Mama Safe Fit Podcast. This is Gina, perinatal fitness trainer and birth doula. And this is Roxanne, labor and delivery nurse and student midwife. And this is the Mama Safe Fit Podcast, where we empower you on your prenatal fitness, birth, and postpartum return to fitness journey. Our podcast shares how to move throughout your pregnancy to stay strong and comfortable. Pain is not a requirement of pregnancy. Understand the science of birth and how to approach recovery after birth. We share our personal experiences as mothers navigating the stage of lives, plus our professional expertise as birth workers and fitness professionals. Our goal is to help you feel confident as you navigate the perinatal time frame for an empowering pregnancy, positive birth, and postpartum journey. We are glad to have you with us on this journey and that you've chosen us to support you. Welcome to the Mama Safe Fit Podcast. In this episode, we have Kaylin here who's going to be sharing her unmedicated home birth. So thank you so much for being here with us, Kaylin. Thank you so much. I'm really excited. So tell us how you prepared for birth. How was your pregnancy? How did you choose to have a home birth? I'm always really excited to hear why other folks chose to give birth at home. I have always been interested in home birth ever since I was in college. I took a feminism course and we watched The Business of Being Born. And I feel like that's always kind of the deep dive into what home birth is all about and my journey to choosing a home birth provider was also a little bit unique because originally I was going to be birthing in a hospital with a group of midwives. And it was a little bit of an ins insurance snafu, the reason why I chose a home birth midwife. I was probably like 25 to 30 weeks along with the midwife group in the hospital when I they told me that they didn't accept my insurance. So it was going to be like <laughs> all out of pocket. And that was like, what? That was like the extra push for me to find a home birth midwife because I was a little bit nervous in the beginning. And I felt like this was just a sign to go with the home birth because it was going to be so much less expensive than going with this other hospital. So what were some of your concerns with giving birth at home or what was making you hesitate at the beginning from choosing home birth like right from the start? Yeah, I guess it was just the fear of the unknown. I've never given birth before. I didn't know if I could do it with the intensity of the contractions. My partner was on board with really whatever I wanted to do. So he was always very supportive of if I wanted to be in the hospital, if I wanted to be at home. So he was he was a good support from the beginning, but it was it was mostly that fear of the unknown of of the unexpected that was kind of pushing me more towards the hospital in the beginning. Did your midwife help you kind of overcome some of these fears of the unknown to help you feel more confident going into a home birth? Or did you kind of figure this out on your own to, before you changed your mind to shift providers? A little bit of both. When we interviewed our midwife, we immediately fell in love with her. She was, it was an instant connection for us. She made us feel super safe. She, her expertise was unmatched. The care that she gave to not only me, but my partner was probably the most amazing healthcare that I've ever received in my entire life. So it was a very special bond that we had. And she just made us feel completely safe. And she had a backup plan for everything. So we felt very good at going into the home birth with her. So you're a public floor physical therapist. Obviously, correct me if I gave you the wrong title. How did you prepare for birth as a PT? Yeah, so going into the pregnancy and also knowing that I was going to have an unmedicated birth, being a PT gave me, pelvic floor PT gave me a little bit of, I think, extra preparation because I'm working with these folks on a daily basis. I work a lot with pregnancy. I work a lot with postpartum, with preparing people to give birth in whichever way they wish to give birth. So for me personally, I made sure that I was very active during my pregnancy. I was walking every day. I was doing prenatal yoga. I was doing some strength training. 
pelvic mobility type stuff. I found you guys actually during my pregnancy and uh, I love following along with your little short reels on Instagram about mobilizing pelvis and internal rotation and all of that good stuff. So it was nice to kind of follow along with what you guys were saying as well. It was super, super helpful. But just staying ha- active during the pregnancy was probably the most important thing for me. And then towards the end, going more towards the mobility side of things, using the birth ball, doing more pelvic mobility, more internal rotation, all that good stuff. Did your pregnancy change the way that you provided care as a PT? And we'll, we'll ask after your birth to see if that influenced any of your care as well. Because I know for me as a trainer, each of my births has impacted how I approach helping other people during their pregnancy. And I know for Roxanne, it has influenced her as a nurse and as a student midwife by giving birth. So I wonder if for you as a PT, if it's influenced your care towards your patients, hopefully in a positive way. Definitely. Yeah. And it's almost like as I was going through my pregnancy, it was a little bit of like research for me in a way because I could see how my body was changing and I could feel how my body was changing. And that gave me more of a more of a like informed way of treating my pregnant patients because I was actually going through it myself. And then after I went through the labor and delivery, it gave me another side of things for almost like empathy for my patients, which is super cool. It, it definitely influenced me in a positive way. So let's get into your birth story then. So I'm assuming you went into spontaneous labor just based on the fact that you gave birth at home. So how, how was your birth? Yeah, so I was preparing to go later. First time mom, never went into labor before. So I was preparing to go to 42 weeks. And to my surprise, smart. Yes. That's smart. <laughs> <laughs> to my surprise, I went into labor at 39 weeks, which was a happy oh. surprise for me. I guess the week leading up to labor, I was having on and off cramping, like period cramps for probably like five days beforehand. And then the day that I went into labor, I had a, like this burst of energy, like this really out of the blue burst of energy. We had a really amazing day. I remember we took our dog for a super long walk in the morning. We went to the grocery store and stocked up on like all sorts of food and made this delicious soup for dinner. And then we were about to sit down for a movie. I sat down on my birth ball and then I had my first contraction about five minutes into the movie. And it felt different than the period cramping before then because it felt like it had a clear start, kind of a ramp up and then a clear ending point So I knew pretty much immediately with that first contraction that my labor was starting. And then I went to the bathroom shortly after that and I had my bloody show and I was losing parts of my mucus plug. So that was very exciting. I took a picture of it and sent it to my midwife and she was excited too, but she knew it was going to be a long time and it was just the beginning. So she told me to get some rest I also had a doula that I hired, so I sent another picture to her, and she was excited as well. But again, she said, get some rest. It could be a long, long night. So I didn't get rest because I was too excited. (laughs) We, my partner, yeah, my partner and I kind of went into, um, like, get the apartment. We were in an apartment at the time. Get the apartment ready for the birth mode, so... We made the bed, we blew up the birth tub, we kind of did some last minute cleaning, made sure everything, all of our supplies were out. I labored a little bit. There were very mild contractions at the time, but they were coming pretty close together from the start. They were about five minutes apart. I got my contraction timer out and started timing them and Probably about four hours into it, I sent a picture of the contraction timer to my doula and she decided to come over at the time. It was probably like midnight at that time. Spoiler alert, I had her come way too early. So she (laughs) got there and things kind of slowed a little bit. The intensity wasn't as intense as it was before she got there, but they were still coming every five minutes. So she decided to to sleep on her couch 
And she told us to go into our bedroom and try and get some sleep. We were in and out of sleep at that time. Every time a contraction would come, I would flip onto hands and knees and kind of sway through them. And then during the breaks, I was able to drift off into kind of a half sleep. Again, they were still very manageable at the time. Right around 4 a.m., they started to get more intense, and I started to vocalize through them a little bit more. So my doula heard me. She came in and gave me a little bit more hands-on support. We were on the bed and then got onto the birth ball. I did a lot of laboring, kind of early labor on the birth ball. When a contraction would come, I would almost like put my forearms on the bed and lift off of the birth ball a little bit because that pressure of sitting on the ball didn't feel too good. But then I would go back down on the ball and sway my hips and circle my hips. And that felt really good at the time. And then around 7 a.m., my midwife came and she just kind of snuck in and started setting up in the background. She brought all, all of her bags and supplies. And I was laboring in the bedroom with my doula and my partner. And things were getting more intense. My doula at one point, probably three or four hours after my midwife got there, suggested we start filling the birth tub and that I would get in the birth tub and do some laboring in there. I was a little bit reluctant to do that because I didn't want things to slow down. Um, but I did eventually get in probably around 11 a.m. And it felt good but it wasn't like complete pain relief, which I think some people have. But for me, it was just kind of like take the edge off a little bit. I also felt very buoyant in there, which I didn't love. And that'll come. I felt like I was floating away in the tubs. <laughs> so I, I'm with you on yes. this. Tina <laughs> yeah. also feels like she was abandoned. <laughs> like, do we just all abandoned her as soon as she got into the tub, away. even though we were <laughs> directly next to her. Yeah. And that'll come into play once I started pushing. I, I did not like pushing in the tub just because I just felt very just, again, floating away, buoyant, not a lot of leverage. Anti-gravity. Yeah. In the water. Exactly. So I, I spent a couple hours in the tub in the morning and then eventually I got out. I had my midwife check me at that point because I just wanted to know where I was at that time. I felt like a lot of time have, had passed since my first contraction and just wanted to kind of get in the right headspace of where I was. And she checked me and I was four centimeters. So I was a little bit discouraged with that because I felt like I was going for so long. I think it, at this point it had been like 16 hours and I didn't feel like I was making too much progress. And they were still, my contractions were still five minutes apart. So they weren't really getting closer together at this point, but the intensity was getting a more and more intense as time went on. So my doula suggested a change of scenery. So we went from my bedroom to the living room. And my living room, we had a lofted space. So I was going up and down the stairs. We were doing squats. We were using the rebozo to get into kind of deeper squats, changing positions. And then we decided to go into the shower, my partner and I, to see if maybe the shower would be helpful for pain relief. And I liked the shower even less than I liked the tub. The shower <laughs> was just not my jam. It felt too slippery in there and I couldn't get into the positions that I wanted to get into. So we got out of the shower. And at this point, it's probably, I want to say like 4 p.m., the next day. So I went into labor on a Saturday night and it's like 4 p.m. on Sunday. My doula also suggested trying the breast pump to, to try and get my contractions a little bit closer together. So we hooked that up and I was at this point fearful of things getting more intense because I thought, how can things get more intense than this? And why do we want the contractions to be even closer than they are right now? I'm like thinking to myself, I don't know if I want this to happen. So I was a little bit reluctant to try the breast pump. And in the end, I don't think it helped too, too much. We had it on for probably 30 minutes and nothing really changed. 
And by this point, I'm looking out the window and the sun is starting to set and I'm like, okay, another day has passed and I'm still in labor. So I'm getting more and more discouraged kind of by the hour. And my birth team wanted to leave us alone for a little bit and see if that would kind of get things going. And as the sun is setting and if nobody is watching us, maybe that'll increase the increase the contractions a little bit more. So they left. They went to get dinner. It was my midwife, the assistant midwife, my doula, and then I also had a birth photographer. So they all left. So it was me and my partner at home just laboring by ourselves And so we decided to go back into the bedroom, into the master bath, and I got backwards on the toilet and did some laboring there. And I think that was a little bit of a turning point for me because things, I felt a shift and things started to get more and more intense. And after about an hour of that, I wanted my partner Ryan to call our birth team back because I felt like I needed their support. So they got back pretty quickly. I think she checked me again at that point. I was only six centimeters. So I was still not happy with that progress. And at this point, I was starting to doubt myself a little bit and thinking, okay, what's our plan? Should we plan to transfer to the hospital? What are we going to do? And the whole time I was fine, baby was fine. It was just the exhaustion that was getting to me and, and the discomfort was just getting so intense But I am stubborn and I didn't want to transfer to the hospital and we were all doing good and heart rate was good. So we planned to stay. And I think at that point, the the water in the tub was too cold for me to get in. So, but I wanted to get in. So they, my birth team was like, taking the water out of the tub with buckets and like boiling hot water and putting it in. And this went on for probably like 45 minutes until the temperature was warm enough for me to get in. And so I eventually got in and I think my partner got in with me and he's giving me hip squeezes and my doula's putting like cold washcloths on my forehead and we're just laboring for another couple hours. And I'm I'm pretty sure I went through transition in the tub. I, at one point, I started vomiting. I had this raging headache. I was exhausted. It was just not the funnest time. And then I eventually got out of the tub. I wanted to, to change positions and, and walk around a little bit. And I had my midwife check me again. It was probably around midnight at this point on Sunday. And it was eight centimeters, but I had an anterior lip. And uh, my midwife suggested holding the lip back. And I do a couple of like practice pushes to see if we can get his head past the lip. And my water still hadn't broken at this point. So I still had kind of a bulging bag of water. She didn't want to break it. um, And I was fine with that. And we did that for probably like an hour. And as she was holding back the lip at one point, my water burst. So my water broke. And at that point, things got really intense. There was a definite shift in how I was feeling physically and the the pressure on like my sacrum and tailbone was just the most intense pressure that I've ever felt. And I got a little panicky at that point. I was like, is this supposed to happen? And my doula was like, this is good. This is great. We want this to happen. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't know how much longer I can take this for. So eventually we went on for a couple more hours and then eventually I was 10 centimeters and it was really time for me to start pushing. But looking back on my birth, I wish I waited a little bit and kind of labored down a little bit because I pushed for a very long time. I think my total pushing time was like four to five hours. And I think if I could go back and do it over again, I would just labor down a little bit more instead of actively push for that long because I was very exhausted by the end of it. I did pushing in all different positions. I wanted to try all fours. I wanted to try side lying. We did some squatting positions. Most of those, all fours and squatting and side lying, actually, I was getting these like really bad cramps in like my hip flexors and my calves. 
because I think I was just pushing way too hard and way too intensely that my whole body was just starting to cramp up and and tighten up. So my body was almost working against me at that point. The position that I actually got the most leverage in was on my back, which was interesting to me. Being a pelvic floor PT is we like to encourage all those different positions and the position that worked best for me was on my back. My knees were more internally rotated. I had my doula was holding one leg in and and my midwife was holding the other leg in and my husband was kind of back behind me. And eventually after all of that pushing, I started to crown and that was a sensation that I also did not like. And it (laughs) it felt like it lasted. I don't know if anyone likes it. It felt like it lasted like 45 minutes, but looking back at my timestamps on my birth photos, it was probably like a couple of minutes. But in the moment, I'm like, this is never ending. So, 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 and so, I, reach, I reached down and I felt his head and I thought to myself, he's not coming out. He's not fitting out of here because it is a small hole and a big head. But eventually he did come out and I think it was one more big push and his head came out and the next contraction his shoulders just slid out really easily and my pretty sure my midwife told me to to reach down and grab him and I reached down and I kind of pulled him up to my chest and he was screaming immediately and I couldn't believe that I had just done that and the hard part was over and all of this discomfort went away and it was just this like flood of euphoria and happiness. And my partner and I were looking at each other and crying and it was a really great moment. All of that hard work was was worth it to have that moment again. So in hindsight, would you do it again? <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. It's always, I don't want to ask anyone while they're in the middle of labor, like, are you going to do this again? Because yes. everyone is like, absolutely not. No, this not. is it. We're, We're done. Gina said it no during her labor. We are <laughs> done. No more. Three is enough. But then after the fact, I'm like, that's amazing. Yes. This was phenomenal. Yes. I will do it, it is again. A great, it is a big, <laughs> a big high. Yeah. I also felt like it was like this really wonderful bonding experience with my partner. Like it was like a different level of like love with one another. So I'm always like seeking that like romance high again too. But <laughs> yeah, just go on a date. <laughs> no, yeah. it's not the safe. <laughs> my uh, my partner was amazing during the whole thing. I don't think he left my side for one second. I, I don't even know if he went to the bathroom in the whole 32 hours of labor. And he definitely didn't eat anything. Like he was with me the whole time with whatever I needed. He was like gazing into my eyes, telling me that I could do it. Um, He trusted me and he knew that I could do it. And then after I gave birth, I asked him what he was feeling and he was kind of panicking on the inside. And also he didn't want, he didn't want to watch me go through all of, all of that discomfort. And I think it was very stressful on him, but he never showed it once. He was just there supporting me with whatever I needed. And at the same time, I was still very, very happy that I hired a doula because she was there for both of us. She was there for support for me And she was also there for support for him. Like if he had a question, if he was like, is this okay? Is this supposed to happen? She was there to kind of calm his nerves a little bit. And then when his hands got tired from from giving me hip squeezes, then she would kind of tag in. And so it was nice to have both people there. And that's one of my biggest tips for people planning to have any type of birth really is is to have a doula there because they're so knowledgeable in all types of birth and they can offer hands-on support and emotional support and be there for you and kind of talk you off that ledge if, if you ever go on it. So that's one of my biggest tips for folks. Absolutely. I also find like if you can't afford a doula or you can't find one that you really vibe with, having a second support person who is like really emotionally connected with you can be super beneficial. So for me, like I didn't hire a doula, I just had Roxanne, but Roxanne is very knowledgeable about birth. Um, But having that second set of hands was like huge and all my births. And so 
for our listeners, if a doula is not something that is accessible to you, like you can't find somebody or maybe it's not something that's financially available, having an extra support person such as a family member, like that's not going to stress you out. Like like if your mom stresses you out, don't let her come to your birth. <laughs> like, but like, Or even like a close friend can be like a great addition to your birth team besides just your partner. Because again, even hip squeezes, they get tiring. Having an extra set of hands can be super beneficial for labor support. So how was postpartum then for you? So you gave birth at home. My favorite part about home birth is I just get to sleep in my bed and yeah. I just, I don't have to go anywhere. Like there's no like car seat check. My midwife comes back and does all my home visits and stuff with me. So how was postpartum for you? So postpartum was a little uh, unexpected for us. We did have to do a non-emergent hospital transfer. So about my midwife stayed uh, longer than she normally would because he she noticed he was having a little bit of trouble breathing, a little bit of retraction. So she just wanted to stay and make sure everything was good with us. And then she she suggested that we go to the pediatrician's office that day just so that he could check out the baby and kind of make sure everything was good with him too. Again, he was very, very sleepy. He wasn't nursing well and his breathing was just a little bit labored. So we went to the pediatrician and we got in with them and our pediatrician said this a similar thing to what our midwife said and he suggested that we actually go to the hospital bring bring our baby to the hospital and just get him checked out have do some extra tests and see if there's anything that he needs extra so we did that he sent us to a kind of a smaller hospital more of a community hospital instead of one of the bigger hospitals where we'd have to go in through the ER, which was really nice. So he called ahead and they knew that we were coming. So we got there. They took him. They did some tests and they couldn't really figure out what was wrong and why he was having labored breathing and difficulty breathing. They they did a, a chest x-ray, didn't find anything they had to give him some supplemental oxygen and some some pressure, some positive pressure. And he was on that for about 36 to 48 hours. We were discharged after 48 hours, but it was definitely difficult going into that environment from just giving birth at home, especially since I'm not a patient there. So they're not caring for me. And I just gave birth not only 10 hours before. So it was hard even just getting up from the chair and going into his room. And they let me go in and nurse him, which was great. And they gave us a room that was right next to where he was staying. He was staying in the nursery. He didn't have to go to the NICU or anything. So it was difficult those first 48 hours being there, but they discharged us and they eventually diagnosed him with uh, TN, transient tachypnea of the newborn. So just some difficulty kind of transitioning to real baby breathing from fetal breathing. But once we got home, things were definitely happier and we were soaking in those like early newborn snuggles. I had probably a diff more difficult time emotionally transitioning than like physically healing. Physically, I felt pretty good. I didn't have any tearing that needed stitching, which was good. I kind of knew the signs to watch out for in terms of like prolapse and leaking and all that good stuff. And everything went smoothly physically for me. And I am happy that I have the background that I have so that I kind of know the signs to look out for. And if I did need to reach out for help, I could have. But the emotional side of things and transitioning to life with a newborn was definitely more difficult. And he had a really, really hard time breastfeeding. We had a tough breastfeeding journey. He had four oral ties that we eventually got released, which was a huge, a huge bummer. And I think it affected my milk supply because we got them released when he was eight weeks. So it was a long time of triple feeding and it was just constantly, how can I feed this baby? And then I'm pumping and breastfeeding and giving him the bottle of pumped milk. And that went on for a really long time. But eventually we got his ties released and he was so much better. His crying decreased. He wasn't as uncomfortable. He didn't have so much gas. So it was a long journey of uh, of all of that triple feeding and um, kind of 
it's troubleshooting the tongue tie and everything, but it all sorted itself out and he eats like a champ now. And it's just that transition to not having a newborn to having a newborn and figuring them out, which was, was difficult for me. I definitely found the transition from zero to one to be hardest for me. And I I felt like there was this like emotional like growth or like awakening that happened within me when my first was born. So I can totally empathize with that emotional shift. We had a hard breastfeeding journey to begin with. Roxanne did with hers. And I think it's like one of those things like labor can be really hard. Hopefully our birth goes the way that we want it to. And then like breastfeeding just lasts so much longer than labor. (laughs) And when it's a hard journey, it can be like really emotionally taxing. So do you have any advice for anybody that let's say they are a home birth and they do end up having to transfer postpartum for like an emergent or a non-emergent reason and kind of how to deal with that, especially if the transfer is for your baby? Yeah, I think having a support system in place, whether it's friends or family that you can really lean on during that time and people that are not going to judge you or make you feel bad about the transfer or make you feel bad that it happened in the first place is a huge piece of things as we really leaned on our family, my parents, my in-laws and some of our really good friends during that time. And then also knowing that you did nothing wrong in the first place and things just happen. And sometimes that is the way that your birth is supposed to go. And sometimes it will take a a little while of processing for you to for you to feel that way but birth is unpredictable and sometimes you need a little bit of extra help from the from the medical side of things and sometimes it's it's um, after the fact too like you could give birth at home and then you need to you need a little bit of extra help for your baby and and knowing that it's all for your baby and things just need to happen the way they happen but having that support system in place is is a huge a huge piece of things absolutely did you feel any like resistance or like judgment from the medical team like when you were going through the process yeah there were definitely some providers that had more of a like judgy tone and saying things like this wouldn't have happened if you gave birth here or we would know why your baby's doing this if you gave birth here. So we had resistance from some providers, but then there were also some providers that were very non-judgmental and supportive and actually kind of pulled us aside and said, listen, Things happen in the hospital and things happen at home and none of this is your fault. And it's just the way that things are supposed to happen. So I appreciated those nurses and doctors that did take the time to talk to us and tell us that, you know, n- none of this is your fault. It's it's just something your baby just has a little bit of, of difficulty transitioning from, from uterus to air. <laughs> It happens. Yeah. That happens. Yeah. Um, and fortunately, we have trained medical professionals that can support us at home or in out of hospital birth settings who are trained to help our babies transition, to help stabilize us if there's any sort of issue after birth, to help prepare us for transfer. Um, so it's not like good luck if you give birth at home. Like we have medical professionals that are trained to keep us safe and to let us know when transfer is maybe necessary. So I'm really glad that you had a midwife with you to help navigate the postpartum with you. But yeah. So thank you so much, Kaylin, for coming onto the podcast and sharing both your birth story and your postpartum story. I know that folks that are listening to it are going to learn a lot from you and then also hear a story where labor wasn't like this super smooth, fast, easy thing. I think it's encouraging to also hear that labor can still be really hard and we can still have a really positive experience, even if it's maybe a little bit harder than we were hoping for. How can our listeners learn more from you? I know that you're a pilot for physical therapist. So if you want to share like the city that you're in, if folks want to come and work with you um, or where they can work with you, you don't have to give us like your home address or anything, but like where your business is located, um, please let us know. 
Yeah, so I have a small private practice in Canton, Connecticut. It's a little bit northwest portion of Connecticut, a little bit central. You can find me on social media at Lotus Pelvic Health, or you can also send me an email. It's my name, Kaylin, C-A-I-L-Y-N, at lotuspelvichealth.com. And I would be happy to chat with you and happy to see you. Well, thank you so much for sharing your birth and your postpartum story with us on the Mama Fit podcast. Thank you so much. When I was about a month postpartum with my second baby, I decided to start Mama Stay Fit 16 week postpartum return to fitness program. And I so enjoyed it. This program is so thoughtfully designed to rehab your pelvic floor and your abdominal core while also progressing towards regular workouts. Um, I really struggle with pacing myself. And up until this point, I had never actually taken the time to learn how to properly engage my core and manage my intra-abdominal pressure. But this program did it for me and they also offer gentle, frequent reminders of how important this postpartum period was to properly rehab and give yourself patience as you resume regular activities. And by the end of the 16 weeks, I was so happy with how I was feeling. I was already lifting as much as I had been prior to my delivery with no pain and no symptoms. In Kaylin's postpartum birth story, her baby ended up transferring for a non-emergent reason after birth. So baby was having a little bit hard time transitioning and was having some difficulty breathing. It wasn't necessarily an emergency, but they did end up at the hospital for a transfer. And one of the things that's like a really big concern when you're giving birth in an out-of-hospital setting and one of the big fears is what if there's an emergency at home or at this freestanding birth center? Like, what do we do? And this is something that's really important to discuss with your medical provider, especially your medical provider that's giving you care at home or in the birth center of what their transfer plan is and what transfer criteria is. So is there any complications that happen during your pregnancy that would mean it would be safer for you to give birth in a hospital setting? Are there any complications that could occur during your labor that would mean that you should transfer to a hospital setting? In addition, during labor, one of the common reasons that somebody may want to transfer is for pain relief. So it's a non-emergent reason. You're just deciding that you'd want to get an epidural. And so obviously you would have to go to a hospital in order to get an epidural. And then the postpartum, what are some complications that could occur after you give birth that may require you to transfer to a hospital setting? So discussing all of those with your home birth or your out-of-hospital birth provider can be really beneficial to understand what kind of things that they're looking for, what are some ways that they're mitigating those risks, and what are some signs that maybe we do want to transfer to a hospital. When you're in an out-of-hospital birth setting, you don't have the same access to level of care that you do in a hospital setting. And so this can be both a good thing and potentially a bad thing. The good news is because there's less interventions, there's less interference potentially with your birth. But if you do need a higher level of care, it does require time to get to your birth location. And so if you're in an out-of-hospital birth setting, we're not going to wait for the red flag or the emergency to transfer. We're going to potentially transfer at what we know as pink flags. So things that are indicating that there's potentially going to be an issue, but it's not like 100% going to be an emergency, but it may be safer to transfer to a hospital setting. So during pregnancy, one of the reasons that your provider may decide that home birth is no longer a good option for you is if you have like too much amniotic fluid. Now, not every provider is going to say that you risk out of home birth and that you need to go give birth in a hospital setting, but there are some complications that are involved with having too much amniotic fluid, such as the increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage. And so in that case, giving birth in a hospital setting may be a better option for you. But again, Every provider has different things that they would decide would be a transfer criteria, and this is where that conversation is really important. If you do decide to transfer or if there is a complication that is occurring that transfer is really important, it's really important to have an actual plan. So what hospital are we going to? Are we calling an ambulance? Are we driving ourselves? Like, how are we going to go from our out-of-hospital birth location to the hospital How are we going to be received there? And so this is where having like dual care or like a secondary care already established can be really beneficial. So for me, if I was going to be transferring from my home birth to a hospital setting, it would depend on when I transferred. If it was during my pregnancy, I have dual care established at a hospital that I would drive to and then give birth at instead. If it was during labor and it was a non-emergent reason, I would also transfer to my dual care. 
Now, if it was a more emergent reason during labor or postpartum, I would transfer to the nearest hospital, which is not necessarily my dual care, but these are things that I have discussed with my midwife to keep me and my baby safe during birth. So when it comes to giving birth in an out-of-hospital setting, it's important to have the conversation with your medical provider on reasons that you may transfer, like criteria that they're looking for, ways that they're mitigating your risk, like what type of training they have to help you if there is some sort of emergency, and then have a clear transfer plan established. So Roxanne, what are some reasons that someone may transfer during labor in an out-of-hospital birth setting? So based off of research, the most common reason that people transfer from out-of-hospital settings is due to labor dystocia, which just means that there is a labor stall. So labor slowed down and you've been home for a certain period of time that you've established and you just need to go to the hospital potentially for some augmentation of your labor or potentially an epidural to get some rest. You're just needing a higher level of care with your labor progress. And that is the number one reason that most people will transfer for out-of-hospital births. The second most common reason is for fetal distress. So this is, they're listening to baby's heart rate throughout your home birth still in your freestanding birth center. They're not just like hoping your baby's fine the entire time. They're still listening to baby's heart rate intermittently throughout your labor. And there are things that they're listening for, any decreases in that heart rate, along with those contractions that are signs that potentially baby is not tolerating labor and they need to do more continuous fetal monitoring or to check on baby with higher level of care that potentially a hospital would be the better choice. So when they see any of these signs, this would be those pink flags of being like, hey, maybe we need to transfer to the hospital for baby not tolerating labor at this time. And those were like the two biggest reasons. And then the next one would be pain relief. They just wanted something for pain relief. They no longer wanted to have an unmedicated labor. They either needed IV pain relief or they wanted an epidural. And those were the top three reasons for transfer during labor. And even in my experience working at a birth assistant at a freestanding birth center, the number one reason that we did have transfers were like something was going on with the labor that the labor had stalled and was no longer progressing. So it was no longer safe for them to continue laboring at the birth center. Postpartum is a little different because there's now two people that potentially might need to be transferred. Either it could be the baby or it could be the person who gave birth. So they could have a postpartum hemorrhage in the postpartum period. And there are different thresholds of each location of when they would transfer for a postpartum hemorrhage, whether they, one, can't get the bleeding to stop. So obviously that would be the top reason to transfer for postpartum hemorrhage if they cannot stop the bleeding. But some will even transfer if you lost a lot of blood, even though they stopped it because you had a high blood loss, potentially you might need a blood transfer or you just need closer monitoring than you could get at home that necessitates that transfer to the hospital, especially if you find like yourself is passing out because you lost so much blood. That's kind kind of a big deal. Other reasons that you can transfer for yourself is all of a sudden you start having really elevated blood pressures because these could be signs of postpartum preeclampsia developing that you do need some sort of medical assistance with to avoid potentially going to have a seizure, um, which is eclampsia. And then for babies, usually the biggest reason for those transfers is something along the lines where they are not breathing. So some sort of respiratory distress for these babies. So just like Kaylin, her baby transferred for something called TTN or transient tachypnea of the newborn. And this is a benign condition that just develops in some babies. It's around 1% of babies at term develop this condition. And it's caused by the fluid that's within their lungs when they first started taking those deep breaths. They were not able to fully clear all of that fluid out of their lungs. And this can happen anywhere, like whether you deliver at home or even in the hospital. This is most commonly seen um, in my experience for babies that were born via C-section because they were not pushed through the vaginal canal. So all of the fluid that's within their lungs isn't fully pushed out because they went through the belly versus the vagina. So this is sometimes seen in babies who are either a scheduled C-section or potentially unplanned C-section during labor because they have all of that excess lung fluid that is kind of just a little bit harder to clear versus after vaginal births. But it's also important to note, at out-of-hospital births, your providers have oxygen and they bring stuff to be able to respond if baby comes out and needs oxygen. And they can perform that neonatal resuscitation protocol even in out-of-hospital birth settings. So they can give oxygen until they can transfer to the hospital for these babies. And then they usually also have some sort of medications for other types of emergencies as well in out-of-hospital settings if they are licensed providers. 
It's not very common to transfer from out of hospital to hospital. The rate of transfer is anywhere between 9 to 30 percent, depending on if it's your first birth, as well as like where like your provider's kind of threshold. It might be a little bit lower if they're a little bit more lax with their threshold, maybe a little bit higher depending on your provider. So asking that like rate of transfer can be a really great question that I asked myself when I was looking for a birth center, like what their transfer rate was. Number of those that were emergency transfers was anywhere between zero to 5% of the nine to 30%. So not all of the births that happened out of hospital, 5% of them transferred for emergencies. It was just of the ones that transferred, 5% of those were for emergencies. So not common, but for some that might be too high and others that might be a low enough number for them. So it's important to note the reason why the emergent transfers for out-of-hospital birth settings is probably a lot lower than the emergencies you may be seeing in a hospital setting is because the type of patient that is giving birth at home has been cleared to give birth in an out-of-hospital setting. So they're not taking patients that are really high risk or that are going to require a lot of care and support in the postpartum period. And so that's something that's really important to discuss with your provider if you are wanting to give birth in an out-of-hospital setting. What are the criteria that they have for you to be safe at home? Because ultimately, that's what we want. We want everyone to be safe in the places that they give birth. And the best way to do that is to have a trained professional there with you at home to have a plan on when you should transfer, either during pregnancy, labor, or the postpartum phase. And then also know where you're going to transfer to if you do have to transfer, if you are one of those 9 to 30 percent of folks. For those of you that are listening that work in labor and deliveries or NICUs or postpartum units, as well as if you have family members that are wanting to deliver outside of the hospital, just being sure that you leave like your own opinions about out-of-hospital birth if you are not a fan of it at the door and just support them in their choices, especially if they have to transfer. Don't try to treat them any differently because their choice where they choose to deliver is their own choice, not yours. Bringing in your own opinions doesn't really make the situation better, but it can potentially impact their own birth and postpartum experience negatively. Thank you for listening to the Mom and Stay Fit podcast, and we're really thankful for Kaylin coming on to share her birth story. If you're pregnant and you want more support from us throughout your pregnancy, you can join our online prenatal fitness programs and childbirth education course, and you can even bundle both of them together to save 15% off. If you're postpartum and you're wanting more support in the postpartum phase, we have our free early postpartum recovery course that you can do from birth until about four to six weeks postpartum, and then you can begin our postpartum return to fitness courses, which is going to help you rehab from birth, return to fitness, and return to the sports and movements that you love. Our goal with all of our postpartum fitness programs is that you can get back to do whatever movement it is that you want to do. If you're a professional and you want to learn more from us, you can join our birth worker course or our prenatal and postpartum fitness trainer course, and you can even earn CEUs. You can explore all of our courses on our website at mamasafefit.com and use code STORY10 to get 10% off any of our online offerings. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel so you get notified whenever we release new episodes. We release new episodes every Wednesday and new birth stories every Friday.